Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our January installment of our monthly trust tour series. Uh, we are here today at the Brooklyn Museum to share an exciting new installation within their American Art Galleries. For those of us, or for those of you who were with us earlier this month for our virtual Americana Week program, you'll remember meeting Catherine Butter and Liz St. George, who are the uh, Director of Curatorial Affairs and Senior Curator of Decorative Arts and Assistant Curator of Decorative Arts, respectively, here at the Brooklyn Museum, both of whom arrived early last year and in response to uh, the activities of last spring, the re reconciliation of narrative and inclusion and equity that all the arts institutions are proactively facing now, uh, decided to take the American Art Galleries as an opportunity to recreate and reinstall the Brooklyn Museum's collection in an exciting, informative, and meaningful new way. So please allow me to introduce Catherine and Liz. Thank you, Matt. So I'll just start with a little bit of sort of the origin of this project and also set up some expectations, which is we have not reinstalled all of the American galleries. That's what we're hoping to do, but we really wanted to start with some experiments. But let me sort of back up a little bit, which is um, during the spring, especially with the murder of George Floyd, um, some echoes of things that we had already been told um, about these galleries and how they really could evince trauma. Um, those of you who've been here in the past, remember that these gallery walls were filled with portraits of um, white colonialists. And it, the activities in the spring, the protests, the res it, we really felt like we needed to make a response to that. And it made us look at the collections and what stories could we tell. But first we even had to think about what the collection was. The collection had been formed primarily by uh, white collectors, especially white male collectors, and they had been interested in primarily the objects which that what they thought their ancestors had collected or people like them had um, owned. So we really wanted to look at objects with new narratives, and that meant not just us alone, we were um, also inspired and we've had partnerships with uh, scholars who've really been looking at some of these narratives so although we may be telling it a little bit differently in these galleries we are um, not um, the only ones doing this so we really wanted to focus on rather than traditional museum installations which look at style design and provenance and biography we wanted to look at actually how did the materials um, get to be in the workshops and who worked on these objects. So rather that you'll notice that behind me, rather than um, a whole row of colonial portraits, we actually have two copies of colonialists, white colonialists, but we also have incorporated portraits of African American women, one by Dinga McKinnon and the other by Faith Ringel, to really to um, communicate that the uh, portraiture, but also identity, is not just a white identity, which you only saw when you came into these galleries. So these are not, this is an experiment. We have different groupings, and Liz and I will talk about them, um, that we hope that we're going to get feedback from our visitors, um, which will help inform a larger reinstallation project of all the American collections. And we think of all the American collections being not only American painting and sculpture, but decorative arts and also indigenous arts. So we're working collaboratively with our colleagues and other departments. So let me start with um, one of our themes is looking at um, British America and thinking about that as opposed to Spanish America, which we'll do in a few minutes. But in the collection, was one of these um, fantastic tortoiseshell combs, probably made for wigs, um, and they were souvenirs. They're made out of tortoiseshell, and they say, this one says Jamaica in uh, 1672. Well, in doing my research, I found out that uh, Port Royal, Jamaica, where this was 
probably made, and probably it was a specialized craftsman. Um, it really was kind of, I would consider it sort of the Las Vegas of the 17th century. It was, or maybe I should say the old-fashioned Las Vegas, certainly not the cleaned up Disney kind, um, full of uh, pirates, buccaneers, privateers, sex workers, drunks, and so what would you bring home as a souvenir to um, Britain? Um, from your time when you were in Jamaica, um, probably being a landowner on one of the plantations where enslaved Africans were working, you would bring home maybe something like this, which was made out of the natural or a, a local material, as in tortoiseshell. Um, if we look at this little cabinet above it, above the comb, you can see we can see uh, pineapples or other sort of flora, but we also see on the doors um, through the fantastic tortoiseshell, we can see some very European motifs, um, plants. Um, but then, if we look even closer at the little poles, we can see that those are the busts of Africans and done in a rather characterized and certainly racialized way. So this, this small object, sort of loaded with meaning, and with lots of different narratives that we can really pull out for our audiences. So we can clarify some of the, um, the trade about British America, which brings us to the next grouping over here. So in traditional decorative arts installations or American art installations, we might be looking at the tea table and thinking about its style, where it came from its um, design sources. We might be looking at the provenance of who owned it, and we might be looking at the narrative of the, uh, the workshop. But in this installation, we really wanted to talk about where these materials of the mahogany came from, um, where the labor came from, where the sugar that was in the sugar bowl that's by Meyer Myers um, came from, and even the spices that went into the posset that was in the, the posset pot that's on the table, or coffee and tea. Really wanted to think about the labor that went into these comestibles or these products. So it doesn't mean that the narratives or the stories about the um, design aren't important, but in this installation we really wanted to focus on who produced those. For instance, um, the tea table was made in Rhode Island, and actually Rhode Island had quite a large population of enslaved people. Therefore, could the, um, the furniture, the cabinet maker, Robert Harold, have enslaved workers in his workshop? We don't know, but it opens up the narrative to start thinking about those things. That it is not just the white viewpoint. Um, we think about the Meyer Myers, certainly David Barquist and others have done extraordinary works about um, the Jewish community in New York. Um, that's one story to tell about the sugar bow, the sugar um, basin. But another is to think about the commodity that was in it that created so much wealth for British landowners who had plantations in the Caribbean um, that were basing their wealth and were able to own silver, sugar basins, and other objects. Um, during the early 19th century, fortunes were lost with the abolition of slavery and also the fact that the prices for sugar plummeted. So the, um, it, it made fortunes and it also destroyed fortunes. Um, tea, um, we don't know much about the labor that went into the, uh, the tea plantations, but again, probably ill if not um, not paid, uh, labor went into cultivating and processing the tea that was brought to Britain and to the um, United States, well, the colonies and then the United States, and coffee the same thing. And of course the whole beginning of the trade starts with spices, and the positive pot can tell the story about all the different spices that were traded to come to this country, and again, we're building wealth for American um, colonists. Liz, do you want to talk about the Spanish America a little bit? Sure. So particularly with 
this festival hat, we and you might want to get up into the 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 details of it. Um, it was made for an Amara official um, who would have worn this um, during uh, in in Bolivia, um, which was one of the most major um, vigorous sites of silver mining um, during the 18th century. And we know that the, the silver mines would have utilized indigenous as well as African, Ameri African uh, labor. Um, and that this object, while very beautiful, is indicative of um, the use of, of, of enslaved labor. Um, and the reliance upon enslavement and racialized caste systems mm -hmm. to make decorative objects. Okay, and then if you want to pan right, we have this uh, amazing mahogany armchair, which, um, Catherine, did you talk much about the, the mahogany trade with the, the table at all? Um, so the the we can talk about the as Catherine mentioned with the, the tea table traditionally how this chair may be interpreted would be through its design sources um, the fact that it's looking um, to 18th century European models um, but this chair is produced in Mexico and uh, is made out of mahogany. Um, which, of course, was uh, another trade that was hampered by enslaved labor. So rather than talking about this stylistically, um, the label that we chose to write for this um, talks about the mahogany trade as it relates to the Atlantic world um, and the um, Atlantic uh, slave trade. This traveling desk um, was made in the Andes, um, probably Peru or Bolivia, and as you can see, um, had the, the lid illustrates this beautiful scene of, of Adam and Eve, which again is a very popular um, European motif. Um, on the drop front, you see pictures of animals uh, as well as um, conquering Europeans framed by um, racialized characters of indigenous figures who are being um, literally trampled by the, these animals. Um, so this again speaks to the conquering of South America by European powers um, and the great atrocities that were committed against indigenous communities. And then I don't know if you want to get some of the, the detail on the side, which again perpetuates the, that same narrative. The next section of the installation, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm watching where I'm going. Uh, the next section of the installation focuses on African American artistic production. Um, and of course, we have this beautiful portrait uh, by jo Joshua Johnson, who was born uh, into slavery and freed by his father. Um, his mother was an enslaved woman, um, his father was white. Um, Johnson worked primarily in Baltimore uh, painting these these kinds of um, uh, docile portrait, fam familial portraits um, of, of colonialists in Baltimore where I believe about a fifth of the population was African American which gave him some liberty to um, have a free and open creative artistic practice. 
the next set of objects that utilize are um, African American, that focus on um, African American artistic production, um, are this cane as well as water jug by Thomas Kamara. Um, just as a, as a footnote before I dive deeply into these objects, uh, the Brooklyn Museum doesn't have many decorative arts objects that we can firmly attribute to being produced by African American makers. As Catherine mentioned in her introduction to the tour, um, the collecting practices of the institution tended to focus on um, white male production or production for a, a, a white European audience. So what we do have in the collection is very minor, minor, but it is an area that we're hoping to expand upon and, and explore through different narratives and creative narratives, as Catherine was explaining with some of the, the silver. The jug was produced by Thomas Kamara, and if you want to get uh, zoom in closely to it, um, you'll see that he has signed this jug very firmly de declaring his own authorship of the piece. And it's very typical, typical of the kinds of works that Kamara um, produced. Uh, Kamara was a potter who worked in the Lower East Side and uh, the Corlers Hook section of the Lower East Side during the early 19th century. And he made these kinds of utilitarian jugs with this stamped um, decoration that was articulated with this cobalt blue, blue, blue glaze, excuse me. Um, Kamara himself was an abolitionist and in 1820 traveled to Sierra Leone um, as part of the American Colonization Society, um, which endorsed the return of um, freed African slaves um, to Africa. The next object in this case is this cane. And maybe if you want to go on the other, the other side, you can get in some of this detail. Um, we believe this was made by an African American maker, although we have yet to identify um, who, who that might have been. We presume as much because of the the style of the cane is in making of similar types from Africa, particularly from West Africa. Um, and the carving style and figuration has a relationship to canes of, and staffs um, of similar type from, from West Africa. But the subject matter is distinctly dealing with African American concerns um, in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, as you can see, there are, in the medium register, there are slave ships. Um, below, you see um, enslaved Africans who's, um, who are uh, chained and bound. Um, and then, uh, uh, the second to the top register, you see Lady Liberty breaking the chains and serving, um, giving freedom um, to the enslaved um, population. And at the top of the cane is Abraham Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation, um, giving liberty to some slaves, although we know with the Emancipation Proclamation that uh, word did not travel to many uh, of the enslaved population of the Confederate States, and they remained enslaved um, in the direct uh, aftermath of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. The final section that we'll talk about today deals with abolition. Um, and we have this punch bowl as well as the Wedgwood slave medallion and a trivet with Harriet Beecher Stowe um, depicted on it to uh, talk about abolition. But it was important for, excuse me, it was important for the purposes of this installation to not uh, 
treat abolition uh, to, 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 to treat abolition in a contemporary context, but also explain how it was defined during the 19th century. And during the 19th century, abolitionism was not for equality, that there was still a very paternalistic, um, very pejorative attitude towards the, the freedom of black Americans, um, where full freedom was not endowed to them and was only given through a limited sense of power and agency. And that's exhibited in some of the supplicant imagery that you see um, in something, something like the Wedgwood Slave Medallion, um, where the man is kneeling, or the Harriet Beecher Stowe um, trivet, where you also see uh, the characters from her novel in this kind of um, hero worship state. We, of course, look at abolitionism very differently now in response to Black Lives Matter and other contemporary political movements as the destruction of oppress oppressive political, social, cultural, and economic systems that um, hamper the freedom and liberties of people of color. And that is what this new installation attempts to explore. So this is a great object. Um, it not only talks about free trade, um, but it, it's, as you can see in the centerpiece, it says, freedom to the slave, um, GW. So this is a, a punch bowl celebrating abolitionism um, in, the, and it's dated 1792. So this is punch, a punch bowl that's celebrating abolitionism. Um, in the, the late 18th century. Um, moving back to this case here, um, every great decorative arts collection has one of these Wedgwood slave medallions, but it's still, of course, um, always very powerful in its messaging. Um, as most of you know, it was designed by Henry Weber and modeled by William Hackwood in 1787. Uh, manufactured by Josiah Wedgwood for the Committee of the Abolition of the, the Slave Trade. Um, and on it, um, so, uh, the phrase, am I, not an, am I not a man and a brother, is proclaimed um, as, as a plea um, to consider equality um, for the freedom of enslaved Africans. And the, the last subject is this trivet, um, probably after a, a cartoon by George Cruikshank, um, that celebrates Harriet Beecher Stowe's famed novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published in 1852, um, of course, years before the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation. And here, the, the, tit the title of the character, Uncle Tom, is shown. Um, in bound in chains, um, pleading for freedom, um, but of course, be, as 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 I have talked about with um, some of the supplicant imagery around 19th century abolitionism, Harriet Beecher Stowe's cast as this white savior, which um, emphasizes this belief that. Um, uh, white Americans were superior to black Americans, um, even in the cause for, for abolition. And that, I believe, is our last object in the, the installation. Um, are there any yep, well, questions? Yep, I have a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to begin by saying how exciting it is to be with you as this project is just starting. Mm -hmm. um, what an exciting and innovative approach not to jump in and try and complete it all as a package, but to take this section as a test case scenario of sorts and um, monitor your achievements and the efficacy and efficacy of what you have pulled together here. How do you plan to 
judge or success and impact. And we mentioned earlier, I believe, um, looking at visitor responses. Could you uh, explore that with us in terms of uh, gauging the, the impact of this project to date? So we have something called ASK, ASK, which can not only can ask questions, but also can be elicit um, information. So we're hoping that our audience, audiences will respond to that. Um, you know, in the old days, we might have a response station, but with the pandemic, we don't have things like that in museums right now. Um, plus, we are also going to be doing uh, focus groups. We're going to be doing uh, an advisory group. So we're, this is sort of the beginning to going back to what I said earlier to respond to the moment. It didn't seem okay just to say, we're working on it, come back in five years. It seemed like we needed to do something quickly, um, powerfully, and um, really see whether we were responding in the right way. And so that's what we're hoping is that we will continue to build, listen to more and more people to um, help us, guide us into the future. I mean, as we know today, we all work collaboratively, so we'll work collaboratively with our communities and we get lots of input. Excellent. And uh, in terms of the community focus of that engagement, um, how do you go out and build those connections to have uh, people come in who want to participate and want to advocate on behalf, on behalf of your work, but also to lend their insight and uh, understanding? Well, the museum has a long tradition of working with different communities, so we need to build on that. Um, I just recently moved back to New York, and I lived in that other borough, so I think that happened. So, but that doesn't mean that um, we, we learn from our colleagues, whether they're in the education, visitors, and parents, to get those kind of connections, in addition to all the local organizations that we build here in Brooklyn, who we're hoping to be a partner with. There's the Historical Society, now which has merged with the Public Library. We've been in conversation with them. They will help us move forward. So there's lots of community organizations, but then also thinking even bigger and broadly, like Jewish organizations in Brooklyn. Of course, there's the Lenape Bay Center, the museum's already been working with them. So just keep building that kind of momentum for participation. And as you mentioned, the rapidity with which this project came together, drawn entirely from existing holdings, I imagine. Yep. Um, and it's an incredible to strike of the Brooklyn Museum collection yet again, because you seem to be pulling from cross department uh, lines, mm -hmm. which in, even 10 years ago, the museum field was a hard feat to accomplish. Your, uh, institutional departments really wanted to hold on to, to what they had. Um, and to me, this speaks to a, a new era of great collaboration, as you mentioned. So that's exciting. But as you build on this, uh, do you foresee uh, collecting and acquisition opportunities tied specifically to this project in a way that you can identify and fill the holes that will prove instrumental as you continue the effort? I, I certainly hope so. Let me put it that way. I mean, I would love us to find donors, lenders who will um, help build this collection. And I'm not gonna say break the balance, but certainly ameliorate it so that it is, that we actually can show more objects like these um, in order to tell richer narratives. I think that would be, you know, there, I think there are artists that we've already can identify that we can then keep, that we look out for and hope that we're, and I think this is also, we can bring donors in here and say this is what we want to do more of, help us do more of this. So that's what we're hoping to build. What's so important is that I mean, these objects are uh, selected to make a specific statement, but you're not pulling out secondary quality objects. I mean, these are indicative of the museum and the superlative collection here. And they celebrate uh, on a new level and with the new narratives, such great accomplishments of free and enslaved, and bring in so many of these important themes that you have built throughout here. And I'm, I'm stunned by the Paulus Punch Bowl, an incredible object. Yeah, and it is. If you were walking through here, perhaps you'd just continue walking by thinking of this 
bowl in its rather poor condition, but uh, what a powerful object with so much to unpack. And, um, hopefully, uh, the objects such as these will continue to inspire visitors and to speak to them about the power of uh, the decorative arts and how it can uh, cast uh, history in new light and uh, open up important points of conversation. Yeah. Is there any? I mean, I guess I would just say the irony is these were on view, but they weren't given the centrality that we're giving them right now. And I think that's what is important. Isn't just building a whole new collection, but it's what stories can we tell from the objects that we already have? How can we switch the narratives? How can we give them the place where they don't seem stuck in a corner and become central to the narrative, to central to what we want to tell? So these have been on view, but they, they, they seem secondary when they're next to a giant landscape painting. Now we're saying, look at this. And what does this have to tell us about America, about the basis of our country, about our creativity? And the design was a lot to re-emphasize those narratives, by example, putting the, the caves with the king and the camera on a center, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a sight line with the Wads of Jarrell behind you. Um, it, it really emphasizes those new narratives. Yep. Like now, now the Francis guy, Scene. Right. Like Brooklyn Winter seems seen secondary to this scene, whereas before that was the reverse. So the highlighting and foregrounding to ensure that your visitors come away with uh, an important understanding of the goals of the installation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, for instance, even George Washington was on the site line, and we heard repeatedly that that was a traumatic image if you entered here and if you were a person of color you felt the impact of that. So can you pick somebody more dynamically opposed to George Washington <laughs> and Angela Davis and let it just, the dynamism of that portrait, I think that was also, when we knew that was coming along the wall, everything sort of woof, you know, shifted and it felt like, okay, we're looking at the world differently and that seemed really important. Well, congratulations on this first step on an exciting journey. Thank you. I wish you great success moving forward. Uh, thank you very much for your hospitality and for those of you at home who are collectors and might consider putting an object on loan or as a gift that makes an important contribution to this new initiative. Uh, I'm sure Catherine and Liz would be happy to make sure. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all. Well, thank you, yeah. thank you yeah. for coming and our galleries are open. So, yeah. Every day except Monday and Tuesday. Uh, thank you all for joining us on. Thank you to Carrie for her dynamic work behind the scenes, behind the camera.